Well, first of all, it's a, a great pleasure to be here. I do feel rather nervous because I'm actually... Um, I started my life as an archivist, but I'm a failed archivist. <laughs> I lasted about a year um, at Trinity in, uh, in Cambridge, um, and I went on to be an academic. Uh, but I'm a slight sort of um, collaborator within myself because I actually run a very small museum in uh, Reef, Swaledale. Um, I work for two universities. I work for uh, Warwick University. I'm going to start my talk uh, based there who's the projects I'm going to talk about, went on to University College London. Um, and I also do freelance exhibition curation as well. So, um, uh, <laughs> collaborating. But Linda's very uh, kindly uh, stepped in, uh, Keith, um, so she can help answer questions that relate to uh, North Yorkshire County Record Office. So first of all, I thought I'd just outline, um, in a sense, this developing relationship um, uh, between uh, a museum, uh, academe, and a uh, local record office, uh, going very briefly through another project which started at Warwick. And I'm going to concentrate really on East India Company at home, 1757 to 1857, which started at Warwick and then moved on to uh, University College London, where we uh, now are. So hopefully uh, that gives you an idea of where we're going. If you're in the wrong session, you've got 30 seconds to disappear. Um, well, first of all, um, actually, I should just go back because um, how this project started was that um, I uh, am based up in North Yorkshire, in the middle of nowhere, in a very tiny uh, little village called Reith. Do come and visit. Um, and I was asked to do some research for the Dales Countryside Museum, uh, following on uh, a very successful exploration of African uh, connections in North Yorkshire. Uh, um, and we were looking at uh, Asian Indian connections. So I was commissioned to do some research for them, uh, but also at the same time, uh, Warwick University were very keen to start looking at Eastern sources um, in archives um, uh, uh, that hadn't been discovered. Uh, because North Yorkshire County Record Office is my local record office, I thought what a fantastic opportunity to, to look there. And also I have to say it's fair, I think, Linda, it's a record office that has been underexploited uh, due to a sort of a prehistory in a sense of um, microfilming material. It, it wasn't as open as perhaps it should be. And Keith Sweetmore, who has uh, taken over as director there, has really opened up those records enormously. So I thought, yes. Here's someone I can do business with. So um, looking at the Indian sources, Asian sources there, which led into uh, the Trading Eurasia project, which is actually still based at Warwick University. And this project is European Research Council funded, and it's looking at the different East India companies. There's four PhD, uh, four postdoctoral students looking at the French, the Dutch, the Scandinavian, and the English East India companies and uh, how they operated um, investigating long-distance trade. So it's based at Warwick, and it's actually running uh, for a, a, an extra year. And what came out of investigating at North Yorkshire County Record Office was some fantastic underused sources, like these fantastic um, uh, ledgers of the diamond dealers, fantastic subject, diamond dealing in the 17th century, private traders, that traded from Whitby out to, um, to India in the diamond trade. They also bought rhubarb as well. It's an absolutely fantastic resource, uh, which we're using for teaching resources. So clearly there was things in North Yorkshire County Record Office that nobody really appreciated that were there, these exotic sources that you wouldn't expect to find. And uh, this led on to uh, a second project that was born at uh, Warwick University, the East India Company at home. And this is really what I'm going to talk about uh, most about. So this project explores the routes by which Asian luxury goods found their way into British country houses between the 1750s and the 1850s. How did they get there? By whose choice did they appear? There's a sort of shift in change um, over uh, of the 17th century to the 18th century, uh, male, female, gender, there's gender issues there. What meanings did they convey? Are they really all about uh, European conceptions of luxury in the East, or do they really represent real engagements with India and China? And how does their status and position in the country house change over time? So it's a fantastic project. And in my mind was this relationship with North York Yorkshire County Record Office, which had been born earlier. So I'm going straight into what is different about the research strategy for the East India Company at Home project, which I have some lovely leaflets here, should you wish to collaborate, but more of that later. <laughs> so what we felt was different about this project was that it taps into a recent explosion of independent research conducted by family historians and local historians, which uh, is much assisted by the, uh, the growth of online communication and generating substantial new bodies of knowledge. 
So there's all that information there locked up in very specific family history case studies. It's largely circulating outside scholarly circles and often conducted without references to larger issues of historical change. It's like a sort of wonderful partnership uh, possibility there. So they have a potential to, uh, in this case, the specific project to enrich understandings of the British country house as sites of social, cultural, economic and political cohesion and conflict. So it's combining scholarly and amateur studies of, of the flow of Asian objects into British country houses in the heyday of the East India Company, which integrates dispersed studies of individual persons and objects into wider analytical frameworks that assess the global transformations of consumer society in the 18th and 19th century Britain. And as Keith said to me when I was putting this up, he said, this is fun, this is... This is, uh, this is what you put on your grant application. It's all this sort of academic speak. And it's been very interesting this morning hearing archives speak. I didn't know about silos. I'm going to take that about silos. <laughs> so we all speak our different languages, which actually is one of, the, well, it's one of those uh, interesting aspects of working together. So how do we do this project, East India Company at Home? Well, you can see um, our, our, our team uh, there with Margot Finn, who's the small one at the end, who's the lead, the lead uh, Professor Margot Finn, who moved from Warwick to UCL halfway through the project, which has, has its own different agendas of moving from one university to another. So there's four um, academic, uh, academically trained researchers. There's Margot at the end, small one, this... Uh, she wouldn't appreciate if I said that. <laughs> Ellen Filor, who is our PhD student, Kate Smith, who's our postdoc, there's me, and there's Keith Sweetmore. I have to include a picture of him um, in his absence. Um, uh, so there's an academic team, and we aim to integrate studies of individual people, objects, and houses into these wider analytical frameworks. We collaborate with non-academic family and local historians to produce a cluster of case studies. We're aiming for about 40 to 45 of these case studies. And we currently have what we call 200 project associates. If you take this leap or go online and find us and tap into it, you can join us as a project associate. You don't have to do anything. Or you can actually start corresponding with us uh, via our website. Um, and you can do a case study, more of that in a minute. So you can choose how collaborative, how much you become an associate. These case studies are available to the public via a website. This is very unusual for an academic project. There is not a big monograph at the end or lots of little monographs. The major output is a website where you're able to leave comments. I'll give you some uh, examples in a moment, which has a resources package based into it. Um, and uh, something that we'll deal with at the end, the legacy of this project, which is always a problem, what happens when the funding has finished this website will actually be turned into a downloadable ebook that people can get. So there's a, there's a legacy after it. The other issue is that um, one of the uh, aspects of the project is to look not just at um, certain, certain um, areas in, in Britain. We're looking across uh, Wales, um, England, and Scotland. Also, we are doing that island too. And we've created um, hubs of which North Yorkshire County Record of office, because of this previous relationship, has become the northern hub for us. Edinburgh is a Scottish hub, Cardiff uh, in the museum, uh, and London um, uh, with the British Library. Is uh, Margaret Makepeace here? She's probably in the other... Yes, yeah, Margaret Makepeace in the um, uh, India Office uh, uh, National Ar Archives, um, British Library Archives, is, is in another session. <sighs> um, <laughs> so we connect across these workshops where non-academic and academic join together. So we have examples of case studies. Uh, for example, we have objects like this fantastic silver filigree casket of Tipu Sultan, which has been contributed by a curator of the British Library. The India Sira Sir Francis Sykes was from a family historian, John Sykes, who is a descendant of uh, uh, Francis Sykes, whose descendant left this seal out in India over 200 years ago, and it rejoined the family um, about 20 years ago um, through continuing family contacts. And uh, unknown objects, things we don't know anything about. This one, uh, a portrait which Vicky Cartman, who's the Professor of Art History at Edinburgh, is looking into, combining case studies from all sorts of different uh, people and backgrounds. Family case studies from um, our family historians, local historians, they can go online, they can suggest um, a case study. Uh, nice one at the bottom by Judith Everett, person of interest, William Milburn, who wrote a marvellous book, with Oriental commerce about the countries which the East India traded with. This book was reprinted in, uh, in the 1990s. 
a great deal is known about his personal life because of all the court cases he was involved in due to his second marriage. He had several wives simultaneously. It's obviously he was marrying for money. So it's a lovely uh, opportunity to sort of tap into that we actually didn't know about this person at all. Mm -hmm. So people actively engaging, using their archives um, and their archival research to tap into an academic project. And examples of uh, case house studies at Swallowfield Park in Berkshire, the home of the Russell family, key East India Company players by Professor Finn, who's leading the project, but equally good and very different as case study of Valentine's Mansion, the home of the Raymond family, by, the local by a local historian, Georgina Green. And Georgina has been able to correct much of our academic work, and we comment on hers. It's a, 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 an equal platform. Her boyfriend is a deep sea diver, found lots of things in East India Company Rex, which was lent to another project. So uh, the, the, the interconnections are multiple. We are genuinely learning from each other. How do we do it? Well, we work, we collaborate with lots of different institutions. For example, Osterley House um, in London. We have an exhibition which we have uh, helped uh, well, become involved in called The Trappings of Trade. Osterley House, strong East India Company connections via the child family. The house actually doesn't represent that East India Company connection at all, despite these exotic carved ivory figures, all this fantastic stuff, it's quietly left to one side. Um, so we came in and we've been sort of helping write that East India Company story, along with bringing it in uh, the people of around Hounslow who come to the garden but don't come to the house. Another story. Another collaboration uh, is, again, with a National Trust, looking at Chinese wallpaper, creating a leaflet that looks at all the different uh, National Trust houses that have Chinese wallpaper. The blue ones have definite East India Company connections um, to create a leaflet. But actually, that collaboration has gone much further um, this is uh, by Emil de Bruyne from the National Trust with the Registrar, decided to sort of visualise the relationship uh, that we had. The, the orange, the orange uh, blob shows HC, me, East India Company at home, uh, Emil uh, from the National Trust and AB, Andrew Bush, the Conservator, having access to National Trust archives, uh, visual material and physical evidence. Uh, working with an advisory group via, a, it started a, as a blog, and now there are 20 core cool people who are advising to produce the catalogue, but it's led to a seminar, a conference, which has now become international, and a, big, a bigger publication. So a small thing can lead to much, much bigger things and permanent relationships. Now, uh, while we're here and while Linda has come up, uh, come down from North Yorkshire, as I have, uh, thinking about this specific relationship with North Yorkshire County Record Office, it has rich archival resources, many of which are unresearched. It, unresearched. it really is a gem of a place. Uh, it's an academic's dream, where there are place, things that have not been used by any other academics, which is what you want. You get really excited. And the Shropshire archivist, if she's here, well, I'm sure Warwick and UCL will be very excited to hear about um, her archives. Nicro 2 um, has proved itself a leader in community engagement, museum and library partnership. And Keith Sweetmore, who's the manager of North Yorkshire County Record Office, is a member of our advisory group. And therefore, it led to Nicro's be becoming uh, a, a, the northern hub to access uh, work that's been, been, uh, been uh, taken out, uh, been done at North Yorkshire Record Office, the family history groups, the local history groups as well as, um, as academic things past and present. So that's our core relationship. And just uh, a few slides to give an example of how that relationship worked in relation to a case study, um, which you can see on our, our website. Um, I live uh, in Reith, and Richmond is about 10 miles away, so I thought I'm going to go for the easy option, and I'm going to do a country house that is very close to where I live. I don't drive. Um, I have to rely on Keith to get me to the record office because he lives in the village uh, just up the way. Personal links, very important. Ask Hall, Richmond, um, why choose this place? Well, it contains an unusually large range of Asian-made goods, um, which I discovered at an architecture open day a couple of years ago. Its owner from 1762 was Lawrence Dundas, called the Nabob of the North. Very interesting. Nabob, East India Company Connections. Mm -hmm which had been revealed for the first time by looking into the archives. There's lots of unresearched Dundas archives. In fact, I think there's, pretty, there's quite a few shelfuls, aren't there? There's a whole wall of un unresearched Dundas archives. Um, it's, still in the, it's still in the hands of the original Dundas family, and there are active local and family history groups who uh, have worked around it. So a good 
uh, case study. There's Lawrence Dundas, looking very self-important, um, in 1765, um, trading with, uh, by the East India Company, getting very, very wealthy, starts off as an Edinburgh linen draper, and becomes massively rich and massively wealthy. You go to Ask Hall and you can see exotic cabinets, uh, wallpapers, screens, porcelain. It's very extraordinary. Why is that all there? And it turns out that he uses his East India Company money and his investments to create a whole um, sort of um, line of country houses from Curse, which is up in Scotland. Dundas House in Edinburgh, which is the only house he builds in 1772, a little cluster uh, in 1760, uh, 1760s, Redcar, Marscourt, Ascall and Upleatham, and Moore Park, which he buys at the same time, and he, buy, and he uh, buys a house in London, in Arlington Street, all linked together along the Great North Road. Very interesting indeed. Here are the show houses, Ascall, Moore Park, which is now a golf club, very swanky golf club in Hertfordshire, Dundas Mansion, 19 Arlington Street in London. But where are those India goods? You'd expect to be able to track them. Uh, the only uh, highlight we have, a window into those goods, is a painting of 1769 Arlington Street of uh, Sir Lawrence sitting there with his grandson. Well, there are no India goods there. So where are they? And working with uh, North Yorkshire County Record Office, um, it's one of those wonderful moments where you're working with um, an archivist, uh, a manager like Keith, and... I, I said to him when I gave a presentation, well, I've got, the st I've got all this material, but in fact I have no connection. I, don't, I can't tell you the story about these indigos because there's no, there's no archival evidence there. And he says, have you looked in the box marked MISC? And there was this <laughs> extraordinary, extraordinary inventory of 1763, that house right up in Scotland, and there are all those goods. They are all up in Scotland. The house has uh, been uh, demolished, so I can't go back to the house. Fantastic moment, uh, then able to work uh, with their various other contacts up um, in Scotland. And suddenly uh, you've got an argument coming together uh, about a significant, an, an economy of significance of these global goods. These Asian goods are corralled ge in a geographically peripheral place right up in Scotland, but actually it's a genealogically central home working with those local and family historians. Uh, Curse is the first house that Durst Dundas purchases. It's symbolic of the restoration of his family fortunes. He becomes Baron of Curse. It remains in the family. Um, all these goods remain in the family. They're not dispersed. They're not sold when all the others are sold off in the 1790s. And they're all corralled at Ask. They're added to over time. So it's not just one man. It suggests a continuing influence, a relational environment of these goods. And they have a distinct and separate significance within this spe specific world of goods. And the Japan cabinet, in fact, is not an 18th century cabinet, but one that's uh, acquired uh, by one of Dundas's successors, uh, the second Marquis, who in fact becomes uh, Secretary of State for India. So there's this, there's this, this long story here. So that's uh, an example of how the project works. So what is the view from Nicro? Well, um, here are some of Keith's points. It's always very interesting. In that relationship, to hear back what you each think that you have gained. Um, and he has seven points. Um, the first was that he says the East India Company home involvement is seen as an activity project, not an income project. Uh, he doesn't get any money out of the project, sadly, and we're working on ways that might happen. But open-ended and the value is in the doing of it as opposed to the production in terms of capacity or hard outcomes. So it's sufficient, I hope I'm interpreting this right, Linda, that that relationship has been set up because it's very interesting hearing the archivist from Shropshire Record Office because Keith is saying, I need to make some more connections with um, academe. Uh, we've got York, but they're all sort of nicely stitched up. I hope there's nobody from York here. <laughs> there's Durham, which is over the border. So this is a very regional aspect, yet we can break those regional uh, um, sort of connections, as has been proved. Um, North Yorkshire County Records were low starting point in terms of profile with potential HE users, HE community, a target audience. They needed to establish a dialogue. And through that, they not only established a dialogue with Warwick, but now with University College London. And there's blossoming of lots of other potential. It also wins new and extended audiences for the archive content. Part of the way that we operate, we had workshops. 
a workshop at Night Pro, which attracted over 60 people, which is very good, uh, came to our workshop where it explained what we were doing. We got people to tag archives of what they thought those India references might mean and tapped into the family local historians that Night Pro very, very, have got a very good relationship with. And um, it revivifies the relationship with key depositors, e.g. Ascor, with the, with the Dundas family. Uh, which had been sort of latent. We have a sneaky feeling, I hope there's nobody here, but there might be more archives there, but you know, we're not sure. We want to keep that door open. We do as academics and as, uh, uh, as, as the archive. Um, so, and also, the project, the relationship, reinforces the view of Nitro and its family history users working together over something other than the traditional territory. So it's not just this sort of uh, finding Art Maud or Uncle Henry and whatever, getting narrow and narrow in a sense. It's opening things out, uh, showing how material that you might already know about can actually be used in a very different way. And it renews links, this is very interesting, it renews links with institutions holding related records. This is this cross-regional thing. Because uh, of the cursed discovery, this cursed inventory, a house up in Scotland, and because we then had an Edinburgh workshop, made links with... Um, um, uh, the archivists up at Scotland and so a relationship has been reopened or even created between those two archives which leads us to considerations of how we can work better with them and it helps us to build towards concepts of collaboration for the future so this is just a start now as part of uh, the project we try and keep opening up and asking uh, for comment and criticism we've just we had um, in July our mid-project conference, since it's my uh, last slide. Mm. And I thought it would be worthwhile feeding back to you what that audience felt about the project, sort of in a sense being very honest about what are the good things and what are the bad things and what are the difficult things and what things we have done well. And this mid-project conference brought together over 100 people, uh, family historians, local historians, archivists, curators, uh, people from all sorts of different sectors that we were working with, um, and I do, I do think that, in fact, we all felt very equal. I think it's one of these things about hierarchies. People, everybody felt that they could comment. Um, one of the things that was flagged up was that at the levels of collaboration, they like the idea, people like the idea of anyone who is interested can, be, can sign up um, and choose to be how active or not they need to be. But it's sort of a pressure if you get involved in something. You feel you've got to deliver something very lengthy, uh, it's a bit like homework, you're being evaluated, that's not the case, you can, you can stick your big toe in, uh, you can actually start commenting, or you can actually say, well actually I'd like to do a case study which will involve working with lots of different, uh, different academics, curators and, and other family historians, local historians. One of the problems that we came across, and it was quite interesting um, going back for writing this session, um, uh, looking at the language that we used, we used the word amateur um, historians. Oh, amateur, no, amateur professional divide. And in fact, it was Margaret Makepeace, who, is the, who works at uh, British Library, who's, who works with the India Office Records, who is also a family historian herself. And she said, this isn't good. We don't like these words. They, they, don't, they don't actually, this, this doesn't work at all. So we, we're not quite sure what we're going to call ourselves. But that seems to be sort of, sort of uh, dissolving. It's often meaningless in terms of value and output, um, so we need to feel that we're collaborating on equal terms. One of the major criticisms we had, um, and I suppose you might guess this, is with a project that's sort of about country houses, is yes, it's okay, it's all about the tops, it's all about the people at the, at the higher end of the scale, but what about those East India Company links uh, lower down the scale? What about the servants? Did they get calico cast-offs? Uh, what about the, the, the populations that were coming in via the ship's for example, around here, if we were working with um, Cliff Pereira from the Royal Geographical Society, saying, you know, there are these other people out there that you're failing to engage with, and that is something that we want to do. And my last comment, that's pretty good, um, is frameworks. How do we satisfy academic local government requirements and commit to non-academic government de demands? So, you know, we've all got things that we have to complete uh, you know, uh, uh, assessments that we have to fulfil. So how sometimes uh, those two don't match uh, against each other. 
Obstacles for collaborative research in, in search of published outcomes. Most academics have to publish something, a monograph or uh, something, but actually we've got uh, Leverhulme to agree that the published outcome is actually the website, which has been uh, quite a breakthrough, and I, hopefully more projects will be doing that. Uh, perhaps a new type of peer review group to be established. So who says whether your work is coming up to scratch or not? Is it understandable or not? Does it make those links or not? And back to the point I made earlier, the problem is with, certainly with uh, academic projects, and I think also from hearing this morning about uh, archive-based projects, what happens when the funding ends? Do you just walk away from all these people? We have over 200 project associates. Do we just walk away in September next year? You can't do that. You've set something in flow. Um, so being able to uh, set in motion uh, devices, institutions, things that will keep that going. And that's when we came up with actually producing the, the downloadable uh, web uh, e-publication. But there is more to be done there. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you.